friends, welcome back. I'm Mark Baker, and in today's program, we're going to continue talking about the subject, Demonstrations of the Kingdom. In the previous two programs, we've been laying a foundation. We've covered quite a bit, and I encourage you, if you've not been with us, you've not watched the program, go back and watch the previous two broadcasts, kind of catch up with us. But we're going to continue on with our study today, looking at demonstrations of the kingdom. Now, we've looked at a lot. I'm not going to go through everything, but we started out looking in Genesis chapter 2, where God said that if you eat of that forbidden fruit, you shall surely die in that day. But then in the next chapter, we see the sins of Adam and Eve, but they didn't die when they ate the forbidden fruit on a physical level. And I showed you that what, 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 what happened was they disconnected from the source of life, and death began to work outward. In their case, it took almost 900 years for them to die. And over the period of time, that time frame has slowly gotten less and less and less. And now it's just, you know, a hundred is stretching it. But the thing is, Jesus came, he paid the price for our sins. He opened the door for us to be reconnected to the source of life. We looked in John chapter 15. We talked about he is the true vine that we're cleansed by the word of God. When you made Jesus the Lord of your life, you became a new creation in Christ Jesus. We're going to look a little bit about that. But the thing that's important for our study, if we're going to become demonstrators of the kingdom of God, is understanding when God talks about life, he's talking about that connection to Jesus. In John chapter 15 and verse 1, Jesus said that he was the vine and God was the husbandman. We don't really use that term today, but basically a gardener. God was the gardener who tended the vine. There's not you know, two vines, there's not three vines, there's not four vines, there is a single vine. That vine is Jesus. We become grafted into Jesus. We become reconnected into Jesus the moment we confess him as Lord. Romans chapter 10 and verse 10 tells us that we believe in our heart, we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, and at that moment we become new creations in Christ Jesus. We're reconnected to that source of life. But then I, I, to, I took you to James chapter 1 and verse 21, and we saw that we're saved. Our souls are saved by the word of God. We see in Scripture that our souls are mind, will, intellect, and emotion. Our spirits were recreated and made new creations in Christ Jesus. But we're still waiting for the redemption of our body. That will not happen until the trumpet blows and Jesus returns. Now, because we have the life of God within our spirit, because we are reconnected to the source of life, the Bible tells us that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. In the curse of the law, there is spiritual death, sickness, and poverty. There's also the curse of the fall. That will not be resolved until Jesus returns and establishes his millennial kingdom. The curse of the fall is working by the sweat of your brow, pain in childbirth, so on and so forth. But sickness, poverty, spiritual death were all taken care of at the cross when Jesus paid the price for our sins. We have the opportunity to walk in divine health. We have the opportunity to walk free from sickness and disease. Does that mean we'll never you know, have temptations, we'll never have symptoms? And when you look at it, really, what is a symptom? It is a temptation to become sick. I've got this symptom, and I feel a scratchy throat. I yield to that symptom by confessing maybe I'm catching a cold. I have a symptom, which is a temptation to receive a sickness. I have a choice. Am I going to accept it by confessing I think I'm catching this. I remember years ago, I was in a meeting, and there was a, there was a great man of God, one of the generals of the faith, ministering to the sick. He was going along, praying for people, you know, be healed, be healed, releasing the healing anointing that was upon his life. He came to a lady, and he stopped. He, in, in his ministry, he did this every now and again, and he asked her, he said, ma'am, what are you believing for? And she said, oh, I believe I'm, I'm developing cancer. I'm developing, you know, she went on about that. I want you to pray that I don't get it. And it was, you know, and I look back and it's humorous to think about, but he was making a point that was really 
stuck with me through these years. He laid hands on her and prayed at the top of his lungs, Oh Lord, I come into agreement with this dear lady that she may have the worst form of cancer, that she may have the worst form of suffering, that she may... And she just pushed his hands off of her and said, What are you doing? But what was he doing? He was trying to get it across to her that she was yielding to the temptation with her words. Our words are very powerful. And Jesus tells us that out of the abundance of our heart, our mouths will speak. What you are saying is a direct reflection of what you've fed into your heart. And when we talk about that, you need to understand your heart consists of your spirit and your soul. Your spirit has been recreated. It is a brand new spirit. You are connected to the source of life. But then according to James chapter 1, verse 21, we've seen this in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, we must renew our minds with the Word of God. What is coming out of our mouth is what is in our soul in abundance. What we have planted in our soul determines what the output of our tongue will be. We have these temptations. We have a temptation to be in lack. We have a temptation to be sick. We yield to them with our words. And it's not something we do on purpose. You know, if you are sick today, if you are suffering from a pain, if you are suffering from cancer, diabetes, whatever it might be, it's because you have sick thinking. And yes, that has a different connotation in our society when I say that than it does from a biblical standpoint. When I say sick thinking, it is because you have allowed your soul to become filled with sickness. It may have been just watching the TV and getting inundated with commercials talking about this sickness, that sickness, you know, this drug, that drug. But the reason the sickness is manifesting in your body is because you first allowed sickness to manifest in your thoughts, because you first allowed sickness to manifest in your soul. How do you change that? You change that with the Word of God. Let's look over to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and then we're going to jump back into 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and just kind of see where the Holy Spirit takes us today. But in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, we see a statement about spiritual warfare. And it's interesting because Satan's goal is to keep our focus outward. He knows that we've been recreated. He knows that we're new creations in Christ Jesus. He knows that we have the same power that raised Jesus from the dead already within our spirits. As long as he can keep our attention focused outward, we will not be able to tap into what is already in our spirit. And so when we talk about spiritual warfare, what Satan wants to do is he wants to get you focused outward. Oh, this city has a stronghold over it. This person needs deliverance. That You're looking outward. Jesus said we are made clean by the word. The word in 1 Peter 1.23, we see the word is incorruptible seed. It is the seed that produces the life of God. It is the seed which washes our soul. You may not have purposely allowed those thoughts into your mind. You may not have purposely chosen to have sick thinking. You may not have purposely chosen to have lack of thinking, but you have allowed something into your mind, into your soul, that has produced that harvest. We can choke that, that, those thoughts out. We can choke the life out of that sick thinking, out of that lack thinking, out of whatever else, by taking it captive with the Word of God, which Jesus tells us again in John chapter 15, that is the life of God. And then we saw in John chapter 1, in him was the life and light of man. He is our life. So you can choose to divert your attention away from things that are producing those sick thoughts, like television programs, like whatever it might be. Or if it might be, you might be fearful thoughts. You might have anxiety. He, in Isaiah 26, 3, it says, He who keeps his mind stayed on him will be in perfect peace. The choice is yours. What are you going to be feeding into your soul? What are you going to be allowed into your soul? Because everything starts in the soul and manifests outward. If you feed on the Word of God, 
in him is life. If you feed on the word of life, if you feed on that incorruptible word of life, it will begin to produce healing thinking in your soul. When you have a bigger picture in your soul of yourself walking in divine health and and healing than you have of seeing yourself with cancer, with diabetes, whatever it might be, then the sicknesses must leave your physical being. It all begins, though, with the picture that's within your mind. And if you're going to demonstrate the kingdom of God, you're going to have to change the picture in your soul. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, in verse 3, it says, Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of life. What happens, though, is because we are not purposely paying attention to what's being fed into our soul, into our mind, will, intellect, and emotions— we are allowing death to be fed into our soul. We are allowing Satan to capture our thoughts, to capture our imagination. We're allowing Satan to use external input to feed death into our souls. He cannot touch our spirit because when we made Jesus the Lord of our life, we were sealed into Jesus. But he can feed death into our soul. You see, it doesn't matter to him that we have the kingdom of God within us, that we have the Holy Spirit, that we have the power of God, that we have the anointing of God. As long as we yield to the input he's desiring to place into our souls. That's why Peter, in 1 Peter 1.23, says that there are corruptible seeds and incorruptible seeds. The seeds of come in the form of thoughts. The seeds come in the form of words. The seeds come through our eye gates. We, what we're allowing in abundance to be fed into our soul determines manifestation in the natural realm. Are we manifesting life or death? Proverbs 18, 21 tells us that life and death are in the power of the tongue, not God's tongue, your tongue, my tongue. Life and death is determined by the seeds we are planting in our soul with our words, with the words we're allowing to be spoken into our life, with the words we're hearing while we sit in front of the television and listen to them planting things into our soul. Because everything you're looking at, everything you're listening to, everything that is giving you any form of input is feeding either seeds of death, which we call corruptible seeds, or seeds of life, which we call incorruptible seeds, into your soul. When your soul becomes completely filled and renewed to the Word of God, it flips the switch to no longer allow that input from the external, but it flips the switch so that the input now is from the external. I'm reminded as a kid, growing up, you know, I was always interested in model trains. In the town I grew up in, there was a warehouse up on the second floor where a bunch of men in town, and my dad used to take us there, had built this huge warehouse model train layout. But when, you come, when you're looking at it, there's what they call a roundhouse. And the engine will come in on a track, and there's, there might be two branches that he could choose from. He comes up to the roundhouse, And the roundhouse then would swivel one direction or the other. And then the engine would go, you know, the train could go in the direction the roundhouse had turned it. So what's happening is when we make Jesus Lord of our life, it's Romans 10, 17. We heard the word of God. We allowed it to be planted into our souls. We believed what we heard and we confessed Jesus as Lord and we became new creations in Christ Jesus. But then... We now are on that track. In one direction is death. In the other direction is life. We are the masters of the roundhouse. 
we're the ones who determine which direction that roundhouse turns. And in a given, you know, in a single day, you might one moment be turned towards life and another moment be turned towards death and then turned towards life. This is something you have to become conscious of and you need to be purposeful about. Because if you just allow yourself to be carried along on the currents of society, your engine will always be turned towards death. And you will always have death feeding into your soul, which is going to allow the input, the manifestation, the demonstration in your life to be determined externally instead of internally. Now, when we're talking about this, the phrase the Holy Spirit gave me for the series is demonstrations of the kingdom. Let me ask you this question, because we naturally hear that and we're thinking demonstrations of the kingdom of God. But your choice of what you're allowing to be fed into your soul is going to be the determining factor of whether you are a demonstrator of the kingdom of darkness or the kingdom of light. And you say, well, wait, 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 Mark. I don't understand how I could be demonstrating the kingdom of darkness through sickness, through poverty, through lack, through depression, through anxiety. You are demonstrating the kingdom of darkness. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. You are sealed into Christ Jesus. You have not lost your salvation, but because you are allowing yourself to live from the outside out, you are demonstrating the kingdom of darkness. But if you will take the word and begin to plant it within your soul and begin to renew your mind with the word of God, then you can begin to live from the inside out instead of the outside out, and you will begin to demonstrate the kingdom of God. How does the what does that look like? That looks like divine health, prosperity, miraculous manifestations, demonstrations of the kingdom. But it's how you are living. Are you living outside out or inside out? Inside you have the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. Inside you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. Inside you are connected to the source of life, which is Jesus. But you have to determine what you're going to allow to be manifesting in the majority, in your soul. Are you going to be feeding more on the world's things or on God's things? We've been grafted back into the vine. We've been grafted back into the source of life. But the choice we make as far as which direction and what we're allowing to be fed into our soul will determine the primary manifestations in our life. Here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, it's, we'll pick up in verse 4 in the final few minutes of the program. But again, you take every thought captive. And it works both ways, friend. You can take it captive for the kingdom of darkness, or you can take it captive for the kingdom of light. Your choices throughout the day are the determining factors. And, and the thing I want you to understand, Satan will come along and try to put you under condemnation. Oh, you allowed this and you allowed that. And when you hear a message like this, don't Put up with his junk. Don't allow him to do that. Many times we've not been taught. Many times we don't know better. Many times we're not conscious of this. We all have pressure from the outside trying to pr press against us. We all have situations. We all have things trying to distract our attention. Don't allow the enemy to come and bring condemnation because God will never condemn you. You may have been allowing yourself to feed too much on the darkness of this world. But you'll always find the Holy Spirit waiting, ready to lead you, ready to guide you. He never questions his decisions. He never will say, well, you, you know, you've made too many bad decisions. Friend, this is where you need to take Paul's statement to heart, forgetting those things which are behind and pressing forward to the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. If you look backwards... Even the decisions you may have made an hour ago that you regret, you will not progress forward in the kingdom. Acknowledge the fact that you made that wrong decision. Acknowledge the fact that you didn't do right. Yes, that's important. We own up to it. But it's under the blood of Jesus. The Holy Spirit's not going to remind you of it, so why should you remind yourself of it? Satan will come, and that's why it's so important to be filled with the Word, because if you look at the temptation of Jesus in Luke chapter 3, Luke chapter 4, Jesus responded 
to Satan, it is written. When he comes at you with that junk, oh, you're not worthy, God's never going to accept you. It is written, I have been accepted in Christ Jesus. It is written, I was chosen by him from the foundation of the world. It is written, I am a new creation in Christ Jesus. It is written, I was created in righteousness and true holiness the moment I made Jesus the Lord of my life. It is written that by his stripes I was healed. It is written that he is my life and he is my light. It is written that he sent Jesus, his word, and healed all of my diseases. Do you see how we respond to Satan's temptations and the thoughts he brings? We are responding with the word of God. We're responding just like Jesus did. We're responding with the source of life, which is the word of God. We're responding with the water of the word, and Satan cannot stand against the word. That is why he comes against us and tries to get us to stop meditating in the word, because the word is where we become cleansed. If you don't like what's going on in your life, friend, just put it in the devil's face. Open up your scripture. Holy Spirit, where would you like me to start? Let's get into this together, and I'm thanking that you're going to be guiding me, leading me, and enabling me to be washed with the water of this word. And just take off and enjoy that fellowship with the Holy Spirit, because he's not going to say, well, wait, 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 you made some bad decisions. It doesn't matter if you put the word aside for years and haven't picked it up. It doesn't matter if you've been living as a carnal Christian. The Holy Spirit is right there, ready to pick up with you where you're at. You just need to open the word and allow him to begin taking you on the journey. He'll pick up with you just where you left off. He'll guide you. He'll lead you. He'll reveal Jesus to you. And he'll help you to come to a place of revelation, knowledge of the word. But that place can only happen if you're making a consistent, constant, continuous effort to plant the word of God in your soul. The word of God is the life-giving seed from which we maintain the connection that we've already obtained in our spirit, in our soul. In other words, we maintain that connection from our soul to our spirit, creating an open pipeline for the power of God to flow for us to demonstrate the kingdom by renewing our minds with the word of God, by saving our souls with the word of God. You can look at the word of God just like a scrub brush, you take it and you put it in the pipe of your soul and you have to scrub it out. Scrub all those corruptible seeds that have been put in there. They can't stand, you know, in, in the presence of the incorruptible seed of God's word because the incorruptible seed of God's word will consume all of the nutrients in the soil of your soul and keep anything else from being able to grow. If you consistently and constantly are planting that seed into your soul. Friend, I'm presenting what may be something new to you that you may not have heard before, but I'm presenting to you Christianity as God thinks of Christianity. Until Adam's lease is up, he can't just come and take over this world. But through Jesus, he opened the door for men and women just like you and me to become new creations in Christ Jesus by receiving the life-giving word. And as new creations, we now have his word, which contains his life. We plant that into our souls. And as it grows and starts forming connections into the life of God that's already within our spirit, it opens up channels through which that life can begin to burst forth. I think about in the headlines, you know, I've been reading about different volcanoes that have come up and have been breaking forth from the surface. When you look at it with a volcano, there'll be like fault lines, but this pressure builds, pressure builds, pressure builds until the earth can no longer contains it and the lava just begins to burst forth. That's exactly what we're talking about. We talk about becoming a demonstration of the kingdom. You have the life of God within you. But it is crusted over. You know, 
by the by your soul as you plant the word and it won't happen necessarily tonight overnight but if you continuously maybe a month maybe six months and maybe a year but what better things do you have to do friend plant the word plant the word plant the word and as you do that it'll start forming pressure against that soul you know those the, the hardness within your soul what the bible calls the hardness of the heart and if you continue to do that those those plants will begin to grow and they'll begin to pressure and a fault line will begin to open and as you continue to plant the word continue to plant the word eventually your that hardness in your soul will just crack just like the earth cracks when the lava begins to pour forth it'll crack and break open and the life of god will begin to flow out of you affecting your physical being affecting your finances affecting the world around you and people will begin to experience demonstrations of the kingdom, not because you earn the right, but because you broke through the hardness of your heart that was created by living according to the external world. And you will no longer be living from the outside out, but now you will be living from the inside out. And like lava flowing out of that volcano, consuming everything it comes into contact with, that life in your spirit will begin to flow through your soul out into your physical being and consume everything that comes into contact with the life of God. And that's the point where you become a demonstration of the kingdom of God. Not because you've earned it, not because you have a special calling, but because you chose to take the word and break through the hardness of your soul to allow that word to flow outward, touching the world around you. Well, friend, we are out of time. I enjoy our time together, and I thank you for allowing me to, to join you today. I pray the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, and as we close out, let me remind you once again, you can live life to the fullest, walking by the faith of the Son of God.